Hello, everybody. My name is Mathieu Salan, and I'm uh, uh, from Sorbonne University here in Paris. And it's a pleasure to introduce uh, the last keynote of uh, the morning. So we are very happy to welcome Elam Kashefi. Uh, she did uh, uh, studies at the Sharif University of Technology in Applied Mathematics. Then she, she graduated her PhD from the Imperial College of London in 2003, went to Oxford, then to MIT, and finally to the Edinburgh University, where she has a chair in quantum computing. And she also has a second position as a CNRS researcher director at Sorbonne University. And our main topics of research are quantum cryptography and quantum cloud computing. And so, uh, Elam, I'll leave you the stage. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, so I guess I can start right away once my slide appeared there. So let me see. I guess I can click. Does it work? Ah, yeah. OK, perfect. Uh, I'm getting there. Perfect. So quantum computing, that was the title that I was invited to talk about. And I was really wondering for the HPC community, what can I say to, to give a little bit of a, in 40 minutes to tell you about everything that we do in quantum computing, which is too ambitious perhaps. So let me start by saying that how probably our community are connecting, you know, HPC versus quantum computing. Well, it's all about data. It's all about big data. We are all trying to collect more data, to correlate more data, to communicate more data, to trade more data. So that's, that's, that's the common aspect of uh, HPC. And of course, uh, we are reaching to the barrier the barrier of our beloved uh, computing machine, according to the Moore law, and everybody in this community knows it very well, that this, this progress, you know, whether you call it a law or not, is reaching to its limit. That's why multi-core or different type of architecture are trying to address this issue. But in a sense, the challenge that probably we're all coming together and trying to find other possible solution and technologies that this dream massive machine that is supposed to be secure and try to be fast and is supposed to be this data machine to allow us, we heard about the previous talk as well, to achieve everything that we want to achieve, to some extent is going to consume the energy of the planet. So we really have to start coming together to address that question. And a bit of the topic that I want to cover is exactly what quantum technology bring to the, to the, to the um, ground in order to see how we can address that. So the barrier, the real barrier, just to make sure that we are in the same place, is that all the classical computing and all the current technologies based on our zero one, this logical state that we have been computing, and that's the basis of our uh, computing model, and comes the new way of looking at the information, which is based on vector computing and qubit computation, which allow us to move from the usual way that we have been encoding information to a completely new way. So from mathematical framework, this is just another vector computation, but actually physically we are able to work in this extra degree of freedom to compute. So this is my crash course to say that why we have a completely new tools to look at the concept of computation. And in order to, to just make sure that we are in the same page, you know, that screen is too long. Okay, so I probably need to look at this thing, but I say so. Potential, you know, like the quickly to say that, you know, we have the quantum physics as the new law to be able to govern an uh, information processing. So that's, that's, that's the one of the elements that is changing. And you know, the units of quantum information again is changing. We are going to work with the matrices and vectors, and these are the operations that we are making. These are just supposed to, in order to give you the feeling that how, how the game is changing, how the structure are uh, changing. And these are no longer just theoretical aspect, I mean, of course, these days you have heard about quantum everywhere, but there are so many different physical systems that actually enabling this vision that came 30 years ago about how do we actually implement quantum, you know, whether it's the photonic, whether it's a cold atom, whether it's NV platform, whether it's superconducting. So there are a lot of platforms that have enabled these things. So, so we can, for the sake of our, our talk today, we have this sort of dictionary because we want to go 
more and more farther away from the hardware and talk about software and application that I want to come to it, that you know, we have this bit versus qubit you know, at the very high level dictionary that you know, instead of working with zero one, we have the vector instead of working with our measurement device, you know, there is the new rules and these, these new features are very important. In this short talk, I want to eventually jump and tell you as much as we are close between the two community, but we need to be careful about the differences that exist. For example, the measurement, which is a very simple thing in existing classical machine, is the, is the naturally is very different because it actually changed the state of the computation because we're doing quantum measurement. As well as, you know, copying, you know, that exists in the classical computing, it doesn't exist, no cloning. So there are a lot of fundamental feature that at the physics level is making classical and quantum separated. And these are, they are not bug, they are actually features that we are taking advantage of them in order to define new applications. So it's good to understand those fundamentally, how def different they are, but at the same time, there's a lot of commonality as well. So um, what is quantum computer? Quantum computer is a device that right now exists and it can manipulate you know, right now is a fully programmable, et cetera. So that's why it's no longer a something in the lab. It exists. This device, you can look at it as a black box. And this is exactly, if you like, another, another CPU, another GPU. Now we have a QPU that you can access to it. And, you know, the whole point uh, from the point of application that we're saying it, it can do, perform different type of computation. And that's a very general way of saying that, you know, it's not going to make everything better. It's not going to implement everything that we have been doing classically. It's now going to be better quantumly. There are very specific type, and it's very important for us to understand what those types are. But effectively, is that there are some areas that we know quantum can do better, sometimes exponentially, sometimes polynomially. And uh, there is consequences in cybersecurity and different area, and I'm going to walk around some of, some of those parts. Just, you know, for the sake of Knowing where we're going, this is a very nice slide from uh, Rigetti, and there's millions of such a slide around to tell you where we are. So right now, what you hear when people talk about quantum computer and various company and startup offering it, we are in this area of a NISC, noisy intermediate scale quantum computer, essentially a nice way of saying that we have a dirty qubit. You know, we have built 100 or 200 qubit. They are functioning. They have the structure but they're not perfect. And I come back to this noise because it's very, very important for the topic of today's discussion. But we are there, we have these devices, and these are part of the roadmap to reach to the full tolerant universal quantum computer that it really become this black box that we don't need to open and we just run the computation. But already, over this noisy qubit, there's lots of application is also happening. And so most of the current status is just to integrate them in the roadmap. So maybe here I just mentioned one of the such integration and vision and again connection between our two community is this recently announced um, HPC quantum computing, uh, hybrid computing um, consortium that was announced and it's very exciting. It's bringing you know, top people from HPC and top people from quantum to integrate. So this, this question of integration of quantum computing as part of supercomputer. You have heard it, you know, several places are following such initiative, like in Germany and other, other places. And there's lots of question that comes with this integration that I'm not gonna talk about. Probably I'm gonna spend the next 10 minutes to tell you about things that I'm not gonna talk about. But I want to highlight that, you know, the integration of hardware, QPU, QPU with CPU, and how to make it a cloud access. There's a lot that this community can come together and put together. So those are the activity that's going on. And of course, the reason we want to do this integration of quantum with the HPC is really trying to find the application. We want to find the quantum enhancement. This is also something I'm not going to talk about, about the particular application. But we are, again, aware of the area that this quantum advantage could be achieved. You know, there are people who have been working on this variational quantum uh, eigensolver, that there are some sort of machine learning technique that you can get sample from your quantum, and they are very nicely suitable for this hybrid that some part of computation is done on the classical HPC, which you can get the advantage. Some part is just sampling from our quantum, and there is lots of research happening there. The other type of integration is, of course, quantum simulation and optimization. So these are some of the areas, just to flash on you, saying that this kind of quantum enhancement are 
already also reach to the quantum application. So here I'm stealing this report from McKinsey, but there is again millions of such reports that talk about use cases. So there are use cases in pharmaceutical, in the optimization, in transportation, in various areas. So it's kind of quantum is coming. And again, this is, this is the area that big data, big massive machine computation are you know, reaching and trying to figure out where the quantum comes to it. So again, I'm not gonna talk about quantum application, but there are plenty of them out there. What I want to talk, you know, to essentially to tell you the way I see in, in the coming years, the flowchart, if you like, of quantum application will be going ahead and how, how we are going, at least from a computer science point of view, we are after such application. And as you will see that this is like a whole ecosystem need to come together. So, so I, the type of activity that we're seeing is happening more and more is that the industry, you know, most of them, you know, are more familiar with HPC community are usually come with their pain point, which is like, you know, speed of the data manipulation, the accuracy, the, you know, uh, integrity of their data, the privacy of it. So, so these are the problem that again, the HPC community knows very well. So that's very good point of collaboration between the community because we are also after the same sort of pain point is coming. Then the next stage that we need to go through in this sort of activity is the translation. You know, you know, industry will say the pain point, but translate that to a concrete mathematical problem is again the people who have been there for the last you know, you know, decade, they know very well how to do that. And there again, we are very common between the two community. Once you make it a mathematical problem and optimization problem, and you say that exactly the figure of merit, we can try it with QPU, we can try it with HPC. But the part that things become a little bit different and is still in to be careful is that the type of algorithm and the type of methodology that we want to address this problem in the case of quantum, it will be very different. Just because of the blah, blah that I was telling initially that we are encoding information very differently. We are in the vector space rather than the bit space. We are dealing with this unitaries is the mathematical is very well known, is the linear algebra, tensor network, the same usual toolkit, but we need to understand exactly what are the features that quantum is bringing and is not just a massive parallel HPC computing. So that's, that's the where that, again, import and export of knowledge becomes very, very useful, the part of it. And the other part is the benchmarking, which is gonna be finally something I'm gonna talk about. You know, now I'm, I'm reaching to the part that is very important, is very close to my heart, and is almost the same thing that I've been spending a lot of time, is that also on the benchmarking and understanding that whether our computation has done, whether this was actually better than doing it via HPC, et cetera, here it's become again very different. Why it's very common that the community of HPC have been looking at how to do massive computation, how to look at correctness and test and benchmarking a different device together. Again, because quantum hardware and quantum technology and quantum encoding fundamentally is different, we need to be a bit careful. So that's why I decided today to talk about things that maybe is not as common, but hopefully to present the kind of challenge we are dealing when we talk about benchmarking and testing and verification of quantum community and trying to see if there is any new toolkit can come from there, as well as, you know, to, to launch, because there's a lot of activity right now going on regarding standardization and benchmark, and we need to be careful that fundamentally there are things that are different. And of course, if we get all of this thing right, you know, have our application, have algorithm, do a benchmark, then there will be this cycle that allows us to finally come up with a concrete way of, okay, what should be the architecture? Because the exciting about our field is that is not done deal. It's, it's not that we really figure out how to build this quantum computer and the architecture is fixed and you know it's just a matter of massive production. It's like we are going through this cycle of trying to understand for the sake of which application, what kind of architecture is needed, how do we need to deal with the noise, what are the right way to integrate them. So I think this application driven together with benchmark would actually allow us to visit all these integration challenges that we are going to look. So that's that's fine, and that was a long introduction, 30 minutes, we are good to go. So I'm going to talk uh, essentially about now the benchmark, and I'm going to spend the next, you know, main part of my talk to, if the one home message I want you to take is that it's a very nice problem, and it's a very difficult problem, and is I don't know if the community in the HPC has exactly uh, faced it, but you know, that's what we're going to deal with. 
So what's the drama of the benchmark? What is the problem that people call it benchmark or verification or certification or the testing or correctness, uh, the, all this terminology? The point is that there is a quantum drama. So we, ha we have been building these quantum devices. They are massive. They are powerful. They are getting bigger and bigger. And actually, we're getting excited about them that they are getting bigger. But at the same time, if you look at us, verifier or tester or certifier need to deal with this massive computation. So essentially, the type of technique of tomography based, that is the way that we used to do it for 10 qubit, is not scaling up. You cannot do full tomography because the dimension and the parameter size is exponentially growing. That's the whole point, actually. The whole point is that quantum has become interesting when we reach to the level that we cannot simulate it anymore. We cannot anymore you know, really completely get you know, the classical simulation of it. And that's because of what makes quantum interesting, makes the whole point of verification and certification a big open question. If I'm not able to even simulate my device, how do I know this quantum chemistry type of data that I get is correct. Should I go and make a drug discovery based on some random sample that I get from the device without knowing the device actually performed the correct computation or not? So that's the drama that we are facing. And you know, if you look at a little bit of all this nice, exciting story about quantum advantage, supremacy, the big experiment of Google, the big experiment of China, and all of part, we really don't know if we really achieve that quantum advantage or not. Because, okay, there was impressive, there is a number of the qubit that is going to be there, but there is, there is this bugging question, if you were, that like, you know, did we get quantum advantage or actually our devices are so noisy that the whole things could have been simulated classically? And again, these are the part, a lot of community from the Tensor Network and all the various sort of methodology come to say that, well, if that's your device, if that's your Hamiltonian, and that's your noise structure, and that's your threshold, actually with clever algorithm, I can simulate it. So you didn't get the quantum advantage. So again, we are at that domain that do we have quantum advantage, or we actually have a noisy device that we don't know what to do it. And the problem would be that, what should we do? Shall we wait till we get a fully universal quantum computer that is fault tolerant and we have put error correction so we know the threshold has gone to the level that our devices are not noisy and only then we can assume that we have achieved quantum advantage or is there anything that we can do for, for the time being? And that's the sort of um, question that I want to first raise it that is very, very important. It's a beautiful mathematical question to some extent, and yet it's very important because we need to know where we are with the current devices. And of course, I would not stand in here if the answer was no. At the end, I would say like, we don't need to wait and come back you know, in uh, 20 years and 30 years when we have the part. But it's, it's really looking at the fact that it's important. Even if we have, you know, let's put it this, even if in 20 years time, we have a fault tolerant quantum computer that it guarantees that the noise level is below something, we still want to know some sort of certifiability of correctness. So, okay, I have this device. I'm pretty sure, again, when people are building this massive uh, HPC machine, they have the sort of test, you know, a stress test, other type of test, that they give a kind of confidence that this machine is working well. But the point that why in quantum this is so different, because when we scale up the device, the device behaving very differently than a small device. Whereas in classical, when you put 1,000 core each other, probably they are similar in this case of scalability. So, what we want is like, you know, the community are trying to, in a very, very different effort, and I'm not going to cover all the part, but everybody would love to claim that we have an efficient, practical, robust, secure, hardware agnostic, standardized certification, and I can guarantee we don't have it. No. <laughs> this is like we are far from to have such a benchmarking suit or sort of certifiable structure that, you know, we say, okay, here we go. Any new device that emerge, we're going to just apply this set of standard tools and we have the certification. It's, it's far from that. And what we have, which I think is okay to some extent for, for time being, is that they are very much tailor-made. You need to know what your application is trying to do, in which hardware you're running it, what is the structure, what kind of noise it is, and then we have some notion of correctness certification, and there are different type of, that was me, sorry. Uh, there are some notion of the industry-driven benchmarking. There is, there is a need, you want to know how to compare uh, various uh, devices, but 
it needs to be very careful. We need to be very careful and we need to take what we have and some sort of certifiability that we have, but you know, develop towards that direction. I'm not saying it's not possible, but it's just there. So, what is verification? So, there's so many different ways to saying it, you know, and there are, as I said, there is different type of terminology, but what I like to say for, this case, uh, for the sake of application, so I have this one concrete question in my mind that I take my quantum computer as Feynman um, you know, predicted it, it's perfect for quantum simulation, I get a bunch of numbers from it, I want to know if it's correct. I want to know that if I get the right data out of my quantum simulation of my quantum Hamiltonian and I get it right or not. So somehow I want a methodology that is enforce the correct functioning of my device without making huge resources. I, I don't need to have another quantum computer to make sure that this quantum computer is working. So I want to have minimal resources, minimal classical resources or quantum resources. And at the same time, I don't want to make too much ad hoc assumption. If my noise is IID, if I know my device is behaving like 200 qubit, like a 5 qubit, there's a lots of underlying assumption that you can take it for the time being, but that's not gonna be a full certifiability if you really want to know how your device is working. So the correct functioning will turn to become the right definition of figure of merit that you want to have. The assumption of resources is really about what aspect of my device is tunable and I can control it in order to, to adjust my uh, protocol. And the noise model is that where the assumption is done. Ideally, I want to make no assumption about it. So this problem is exists. You know, we have tried to show you a landscape for those of you who want to see it. So there is this review article that we have written, try to put this different type of thing in different place. And if you see, there is some sort of diagram of like, okay, maybe you're happy to make lots of assumption, like IID noise, and based on that, you have less sample to get from device. If you want to have sort of device independent certification, then of course, you make you know, minimal assumption, but the cost and the overhead of it is come back, and if I get the chance, I will talk about this overhead. And so, so there is this sort of zoo of various protocol, various methodology, various figure of merit that are emerging, and that's what I mean, that we need to see what is the application, what is the target, do I want to benchmark device, do I want to benchmark performance of my computation, do I want to, to look at the scalability, and each time we'll get its own protocol. Okay, so that's the state. So I'm gonna talk about one specific protocol that we have been working with, family of the protocol, and the scenario is very similar to the interactive proof system scenario that has been the main tool in the quantum crypto, in classical crypto or classical verification. So the story is the following. So we have a computationally limited verifier. So this is exactly our scenario. That I'm the, you know, I am a classical person and I have a classical computer. Well, let's imagine even have an HPC with a massive power, but it is still computationally uh, limited. And I might even have some sort of mini quantum devices that they are, I'm able to completely certify them. I'm able to fully do tomography. So the picture is that I take my classical computer, I get mini device that I do full tomography, full analysis, it could be single qubit resources, could be mini quantum computer, etc. So I start with this basis of the thing that I can certify them, I can fully characterize them, but then I want to take this structure and to say something about the big computer. So that's, that's the structure that I have. So now, if tomorrow there is a quantum computer of 1,000 qubit comes, is there a way that I use my classical computation plus this sort of mini quantum computer to bootstrap and say something about the correctness of computation of this 1,000 qubit? So this is not simulation-based, because if it was simulation-based, I can never simulate the 1,000 qubit. It's a different approach as I go through it. It's just making the assumption of the verifier or the trusted part feasible, and see if there is any technique that allow me to cover this barrier of the complexity. And in this case, I want to also make sure that, you know, I get a certify of a correctness of computation. It's not about just behavior of my gate, the average fidelity. So I really want to know this computation is correct. So, so in, in a sense, I'm putting here the strongest figure of merit, 
And that's, you know, in the, in the language of the quantum is the trace distance. So I really want to look at the density operator which present the ideal scenario of my quantum computer that it's supposed to be if there is no noises, there is nothing there, versus the actual data that it comes. So I want to bond that trace distance between ideal versus the uh, uh, actual computation. And I want to make no assumption whatsoever. I do not want to limit myself, well, look, the noise is okay, maybe it's IID, maybe it's single qubit, because these are all very dangerous. You know, while they are very well motivated from the hardware manufacturer, but if we go through that all the time bringing those assumptions, there will be at some point that maybe they have breakdown and we don't know if that assumption is already there or not. So that's what we want to do, and this is a problem that actually was defined almost 20 years ago by Gutzman uh, and then covered, et cetera. I came from completely mathematical computer science sort of uh, theoretical question. The theoretical question is that essentially in the language of uh, Scott Aronson was like, if you look at all the language that can be decided is bonded quantum polynomial computation that can be decided by quantum computer, can we find an interactive proof, which is precisely like a verifier prover that is efficient and is done with classical. So essentially, maybe I translate it like this. Can we really hope that the quantum device has a very efficient classical way of being tested? You know, this is, uh, seems to be almost like the, the most natural question that we need to, uh, to ask in order to know how to deal with this thing. And the, the answer to just to tell you is the following. So there is a class of the answer that we have come up with. We said, yes, we can do it, but only if your verifier are having the capacity of preparing a single qubit. So a device that is fully characterizable is exist. If you have a trusted single qubit preparation, then together with this, we can bootstrap and give you a very efficient test for quantum computer. So that's not very bad. You know, it's good and I'll tell you, but it still have a lot of challenge. What does it mean, this single qubit? In fact, if you read a bit more in details, what allows us to get this efficient test is that I need to prepare my single qubit and send it inside the quantum computer. And by this moment, all the quantum hardware designer walk out of the room. Send something in your you know, refrigerator and take something out of it is a massive, massive challenge. So we have solved the problem mathematically, but I, right away I said that we have not really solved the problem in a way of implementation unless we go to the photonic quantum computing, which are ideal for that the scenario. So we are somewhere there. Then there is other type of solution that is there that if you have two quantum computer, that they are entangled, you know, they have this some sort of correlation between them, but they are not classically communicating. So this is actually very interesting and people have demonstrated uh, proof of principle with this one as well as the other one. But here again is a little bit of complicated because you need to make sure your quantum computer are from two different company that they are entangled and they have some correlation and yet they don't pick up the phone and they talk to each other to, to do some sort of malicious uh, correlation. So again, you know, mathematically the problem solved, but depending on the particular use cases, you need to be a bit careful to, to look at whether the solution is there. And there's another, uh, again, completely breakthrough in the field from the theoretical and crypto part that comes that we can indeed classically certify a quantum computer if we make some sort of post-quantum assumption of the learning with error to be not even solvable by quantum computer, and unfortunately, they are as beautiful as these protocols are, they have a huge overhead. So. I probably work only on the top one to, again, to give you a little bit of mathematical contents and the toolkit that allow us to overcome those barriers. But, you know, hopefully I also, you see that is they are not yet some sort of ready-made plug into and we have solved the problem of verification. That's why we're still doing the research on, on top of it. Okay, so how do we want to do it? So making sure that, again, the definition is clear. I'm repeating myself here, but it's okay. I want to have a protocol, um, a methodology that is like I run it like a black box on, on my quantum device. And if the device is not noisy, is well behaving, is really quantum, is really having a good coherence, good uh, you know, structure out of it, then, then it should, this, this protocol should say accept, you know, the flag should be accept, so then I know that my computation has done correctly. But if the device is becoming so noisy and it's deviated or actually is not quantum or like things breaking down or there's some malfunctioning, with the high probability, these are our probabilistic tests. So with the high probability, the device should say, well, reject, this run of computation was run. So that's exactly what we want to have. So how does it mathematically it works is that, okay, 
we have this interactive protocol that you know you the verifier have some randomness and there is this prover device you know the language is verified and uh, prover but the it could be the tester versus device, it's like a user versus device, whatever terminology you want to say that. So there will be almost sort of question, kind of interaction, the question that's been sent, and the fact that I'm randomizing this question allow me to get some sort of certifiability. So, so we have some questions, there is some, some interaction back and forth, quantum and classical, between the verifier and the prover, and eventually, what type of property we want to have is that no matter what has gone wrong on the device, whether it's quantum or whether it's noisy, whether it's Markovian, whether it's non-Markovian, whether you know the lab was shaken, whether it is a bad day for the experiment, whether the fridge is you know cool or not, no matter what, we should be able to guarantee the following mathematical property. So we don't want to be in this sort of bad scenario. And what is a bad scenario is that we have run our vector computation. Also, like, you know, let's go come back you know, instead of the qubit computation, it's called vector computation. So we know that there is this ideal quantum state, this ideal vector that is supposed to be outcome of my computation. So the, the, the scenario that we don't want to happen is that we are in the subspace which is completely orthogonal to what we wanted. I wanted to have that result and I get completely orthogonal to that result and yet, my protocol say, go ahead, perfect, accept. So th this is, this, this is the where, where we have been fooled by our quantum computer, that we run it, we get the result which is totally crap, is like you know, as far as possible in, the, in, the, in my Hilbert space from my computation, and yet my protocol say, go ahead, everything is fine, you know, accept. So we write this English sentence that I say you in a mathematical framework of um, the quantum computing is, over the randomness that verifier is using in order to interact with the device, we want the probability, which in the quantum language will be the trace of the, the outcome, sorry, the outcome density operator of my device to be ending up in this bad subspace to be bounded. Okay, so this, this is exactly the type of property we want to have. And you might say, well, okay, you have the definition, you have the structure, what's so complicated? You know, why we, why we don't have such protocol? The problem is that in quantum computing, the whole model that is defined, how could it be deviated? Remember, I say I want to have a protocol that does not make an assumption. So it means that the way that this device might have been deviated, might have failed, might have got become too noisy, is a general CPTP map that I have no idea what those parameters are. So it's a gigantic metrics that is fit you know, somewhere in that part, you know, because I think I'm working with a perfect device which has got no noise. But in fact, there is this CPTP map is applied, and now uh, good luck trying to bound that because you don't have any information of it. So this is exactly the where that I hope you're still with me to understand that like the same way that we are taking advantage of this exponential dimension of the Hilbert space to do computation, that's exactly the same challenge that we need to deal when we want to do certification because I need to bound such a huge parameter space that I have no knowledge of it. Okay, so now, where is the magic? Well, the magic comes the simplest possible computation, which again probably is done in many, many hardware testing part, is that you do a lot of a lot of tests. So essentially, imagine you have a particular computation, so you run a lot of those computations with your device, but you are interleave with them a lot of tests. And I'm going to define what do I mean by tests. So when I'm dealing with my quantum computer, sometimes I'm running a test, sometimes I'm doing the computation. So what is test? Test is something that I know the answer. It doesn't go to this exponential space. It's a much, much well-behaved uh, computation that I know the answer of it, but it's probably useless because, you know, what do I want to run it? But the real computation is that those big simulations, I don't know uh, the answer of it. So now, I'm running a lot of tests. I'm running a lot of computation. If we are able to implement the following toolkit, which from the point of the device, they are indistinguishable, whether I'm doing the test and whether I'm doing a computation. Then we are the deal. Then we have the whole theory method that is saying that like, because the device cannot distinguish that it is going through the test run or is going through the computation run, we can mathematically prove that if the test run are correct, which I know how to check them, then the computation run are correct. So that's exactly the type of protocol and 
The reason that the crypto comes, which I will, I don't know if you were still with me, that we have the single qubit obfuscation, or we're using the post-quantum crypto, or we're using things, is exactly to, to a toolkit that is allowing us to obfuscate whether I'm in the test run or computation run. And that magical crypto toolkit allows us to reduce noise. It allows something, you know, we have this one sim simple mathematical lemma that we love it, which is called the trolling lemma. It allows us to take this beast CPTP map that I don't know how to deal with it, to reduce it to a small subspace and actually start doing something with it. So, so the structure is like this, you know, I put in the computation round uh, of my picture, you know, so if I can go back here. So there is lo lots of computation that is randomly I'm choosing, you know, so imagine you dialing up to the quantum Google and, you know, several of time randomly you do your computation, the computation that could be you want to try to do something complicated, you want to do your quantum chemistry simulation, you want to solve, uh, I don't know, some, some, some other sort of crazy optimization, etc. But the test run are simple computation, which is structurally the same. They use the same number of qubits, they use the same sort of operation, but because they are reduced to a parameter set like the Clifford computation or solvable Hamiltonian or classically simulatable part, now my HPC computer or my classical computer know the answer. So I'm running those easy computation as a witness for the actual computation has been done correctly. Okay, so, you know, there's like just a picture release. So, so there is this beast that's sitting there, that's the CPT map with too many parameters. But if we have done this randomization, it means that I send a single qubit, it is enough randomization, then there is this, there is this reduction is happening that essentially most of those parameters are become irrelevant. This is like a lower bound technique that you can get in it. And the lemma is this lemma, is that if, if you're dealing with a general CPTP map that it has so many off-diagonal elements and you cannot bound it, but if you have insert enough randomization over the whole subspace, in fact, the effect of those off-diagonal has been removed and you just need to deal with your diagonal, it's become reduced to the some simple scenario, and hence you can be able to say that. But the most important part is that how do you enforce this trolling to happen rather than assume that that's happened? So the difference is that we, we don't make an assumption about the noise, but we are enforcing the noise to actually have an effect to be catchable with, the, with those local parts. So that's, that's the toolkit that, you know, I had to deal with the exponential space, but in fact, I reduce it to, to a very small subspace. And at the same time, I have stopped my watch. I have no idea how much time is left. So five minutes. Huh, okay. So, um, so that's the protocol, uh, which in conceptually is showed that the verification approach that I presented as a dilemma that we don't know how to solve it and is drama, we don't know what to do is in fact, using a little bit of this crypto is becoming a simple error detection. So I just want to do the, this detection technique. So what I wanted to tell you, which probably I'm gonna skip, but you know, we, we can discuss about it, is that this has been the folklore for almost 10 years. You know, we build our career, there's endless student and postdoc and grant has been written. And the good thing is that when the field moved, we really revisited it that, okay, are these protocols are really practical? Are they really something that we can implement it? And as usual, as we know, that like something that is written pen and paper is far, far from bringing something practical. And the reason is that we have been focusing in our research so much on making the job of the verifier simple. Oh, it's just a single qubit uh, communication. Oh, it's just like a simple, you know, a classical computation that we have completely ignored what's happening on the server side. And in fact, all of the protocol, which I'm not reviewing, there is like, you know, hundreds of various protocol in this field that has come, they were far from being anything that you can implement on the server. So essentially, the story is that if you build a 100 qubit machine and you wanted us to verify it using this beautiful theory, we would have asked you to please come back with 10,000 qubits so I can use this other 99,000 qubit to able to tell you something about your 100 qubit. And hence, we have been not bridging it. So, of course, we look at it, you know, let me jump out of it and saying that, I would have loved to talk about it, but essentially the reason that the original theory the toolkit that allow us to do this thing was requiring, again, a fault tolerance as a sort of subroutine. So 
we revisited this thing, and in a very recent work with some, some colleague from INRIA and uh, a student at uh, um, LIPSIX, we managed to kind of revisit all of our protocol and make the job also simple for the server, if I put it this way. So we realized it if we want to deal only with the classical input, classical output, so this is a limitation. So we are not talking about quantum input certification and quantum output certification. You somehow, we believe you still need to have your fault tolerant and this sort of overhead is there. But most of the algorithm that we are running right now on quantum computer is some sort of classical input, classical output. We're running some optimization. We're running some simulation with the sample. So in those scenario, we have now completely solved it. We have now had this methodology that if your server is giving you 100 qubit, you only use that 100 qubit, but over and over and over to be able to really do test or compute. So that's, that's the thing. And the key point was to discover that classical error repetition code is all we need in order to boost it. We didn't need to go to full quantum error correcting code, which was a very surprise. I always thought this is not the case till my student proved me I'm wrong. So, so, so now we have this efficient methodology and is really efficient on the server, is efficient on the, on the client. It still needs quantum communication, so that's, that's a challenge that is suitable for like IonTrap platform or NV platform or photonic platform, but with superconducting, you know, sending something in the fridge, we still don't know. So we need to come up with other technique that can allow us to ap apply it there. And the picturally is like, if you give me this five qubit computation, we now have a like sort of a suit of protocol that sit on top of it. First, you randomize it to get those true links. So you randomize, you do a lot of, lot of various parameter, and then you build your computation on that fixed computation and cleverly creating this thing which we call it trap. That is the answer we know it. So essentially, general quantum computation on the gray qubit is probabilistic. You have no idea this zero, one are correct or not, but we are designing in trap that while it's doing exactly the same structure and same number of qubit and gate, it gives me deterministic computation because I create an isolated qubit. So now I look at this deterministic computation that I know the result as the basis to say something about my probabilistic large computation that I don't know the result. So let me jump off it. It's perfect. Everything is done. But maybe, um, maybe one time I want to say that like what we were super excited about it is also it was not just in this sort of maliciousness that you know, if the server is doing something wrong, we catch it. We also are able to say that, what if, if the server is noisy, is a good server, is really a quantum computer, but for time being is a bit noisy, because we know that that's the existing noisy intermediate quantum computer that I was showing you earlier. So our protocol is allow us to also adjust. So now we can come and talk to the experimentalist or the designer of fabrication saying that, what is the threshold that we would like to be able to accommodate and we plug that so we will accept our computation based on that threshold. So we're not making an assumption tailor-made to the noise, but we're accommodating noisy but honest computation. And here, the, the punchline is that, okay, for time being, when we don't have a very perfect qubit, it's very important now go back to the application to say that this particular machine learning, this particular imaging, this particular simulation, to what level of noise it still give you something satisfactory for the particular use case. So give me that threshold and I plug it in my certification so I take it to accommodation. So now we need to put all these bits and pieces of the puzzle together. So, so essentially, the punchline, the question that I raise, we do not need to wait for the universal fault tolerant quantum computer comes to be able to start giving some sort of certifiability because of all the toolkit that I show you. But still, the point of warning is that the quality of this qubit should be still good enough to pass the test. If your device is so noisy, you know, despite the fact that we accommodate the protocol to be efficient, but you will pass those, those tests that we have because the quality of your qubit is so bad, so the computation will be rejected. So just coming back to this way, so like I wanted to tell you exactly about one particular use case that we are very much trying to see whether this, this methodology is working. So we are working with the Rigetti as part of a consortium in UK that we pick our use case, which is the synthetic data, which is creating a, is a, is a hybrid algorithm. We have classical computer trying to create this synthetic data using sample from quantum. And this is exactly the where we want to know that what is the quality of this sample. And in order to do this quality of sample, we need to plug in this thing and 
It's not easy at the end of the day, you know, because, because the quality of this qubit is still is too noisy. So it's still a lot of room to adjust the figure of merit, adjust the protocol, but at least we are beginning of seeing how we can deal with this complexity. So thank you very much. I'll stop here for any question that you might want to have. Thank you very much. So we have time for two or three questions. Are there some from the room? Okay, I don't see any. Okay, ah, thank you. Hello, hello. Um, in some quantum algorithms, uh, uh, like in quantum machine learning, you try to find the best solution, not just one solution. So how, how is your prover making sure you get the best solution in such a case? It doesn't, in, ah, a, in, okay. in a sense. So it's, it's a very good question to clarify. What this machinery is there is, is just to try to tell you that the noise of your device has not been so high that in fact you're getting random solution. So now whether your solution is good, whether it's efficient, whether it's better done on this device versus that, is none of those things. It's just, it's just, you can think of all of the last 40 minutes, what I was saying is just, for the time being, which we don't have full tolerance, we want to have some guarantee that the noise has not messed up everything. But whether you even have done anything better than classical is not coming out of this verification. You might have done something that I could have even classically simulated. So it's sort of agnostic to that efficiency. It's just, it's trying to capture whether the noise has messed up your computation or not. So thanks for the question. Thank you. So if there is no other question, I have one myself. A very uh, new question. You mentioned several times tomography. So does it mean that uh, quantum devices are monitored in situ using this technique? The, if these quantum devices are more? M monitored using tomography? You know, so, so we use tomography a lot, and there is, there is actually, it still is most efficient in the sense because you don't need to send quantum communication, you don't need to make assumptions. So there is a lot of the whole community that I didn't actually present that they're doing clever technique from compressed sensing, they're doing gate tomography, they're using machine learning to do a much more clever way of doing tomography. So tomography is still a tool that is more uh, applicable compared to our tool for many devices, especially superconducting. But underlying of it is first is not scalable. So uh, it's for time being for 20 qubits, 30 qubits, maybe doing clever thing you can do it. But when you go to 100 qubit, 200 qubit, none of this methodology is scalable. But what we are doing also trying to put all these bits and pieces together because main contribution that you will see we are saying is that we're using some sort of crypto, essentially not even crypto, some sort of randomization to allow us to break the barrier of scalability and it's very interesting to actually see that whether we can in, import this to the tomography domain or to the machine learning domain base of it. So there's tons of things happening already to connect that. But for time being, tomography is the way that people do their devices with 10 qubits and they just plug it and hope for that, you know, that 100 qubit is still well behaving. But that's, the, that's why we need to address that scalability. Okay, so thank you very much. And I uh, would like to thank the speaker again. My pleasure. Thank you.